Welcome to Math TV with Professor V. This is Introductory Statistics, Sections 2.1 and 2.2. 2.1 covers variables and data. So what is a variable? It's a characteristic that varies from one person or thing to another. So some examples of variables, if we're talking about humans, would be their height, their weight, number of siblings, marital status, eye color, etc. And we distinguish between our types of variables based on the following criteria. So we have quantitative variables and these are numerically valued variables. So the first few examples that I gave, like your height, that's a numerically valued variable. So that's a quantitative variable. Your age, or the number of siblings you have. These are all examples of quantitative variables. Then we have qualitative variables. These are non-numerically valued variables. So some examples would be your marital status. Another example would be your eye color, blood type, An interesting thing is even zip codes are qualitative. And you might think, but wait a minute, my zip code is a number. But the number isn't used in any sort of way to measure your zip codes, right? It's just a way to group zones. They might as well be lettered for our all intents and purposes. So just because something has a number value to it doesn't make it a quantitative variable. And then we further distinguish between our quantitative variables between discrete and continuous. So here's the thing you need to pay attention to. A discrete variable is a quantitative variable whose possible values can be listed, even if the list continues indefinitely. And the biggest thing to help you determine if something's a discrete variable is that it would involve a count of something. Okay, so I'll give you some examples now, don't worry. Like for example, the number of siblings that you have, you would count those. The number of cars you own. Um, or the number of students in a class, okay? These are things that are counted, not measured, and you can't have Halves of them, basically, is another thing I think of. You can't have like two and a half siblings. You just have one, two, three, four, etc. A continuous variable is a quantitative variable whose possible values form some sort of interval of numbers. And the thing to look out for is that a continuous variable involves measurement of something. So typically, when the data is collected and something is measured, then it's going to be a continuous quantitative variable. Let's look at some examples. I'll just list them. Um, one would be your height, right? That's measured. And it's not like people only come in increments of, you know, four feet, five feet, six feet. That's it. You can range or cover an interval of heights in between those values. So this is a continuous variable. The weight of a baby that's measured, or the time a car battery lasts. The list goes on, okay? You could think of some more examples, okay? And then just to kind of break the categorization down, here's a little diagram. So we have variables, two main kinds, qualitative, this is non-numerically valued, and then quantitative. These are numerically valued. And then within quantitative, we have either discrete, think something that you count versus continuous, something that you measure. So these you count, these you measure. This is numerically valued. And this is non-numerically valued. Okay. So we're gonna look at some examples now and determine what type of variable we're working with, okay? So here's an example. A sample of five players 
On the runs batted in leaderboards during the 2012 Major League Baseball season are listed in the following table. A batter is credited with one RBI for each run scored during one of their at-bats. You know, I'm, I'm not into baseball, so I don't know what that means, but I can still do the statistics. Also included are the teams for which they played, their primary positions, and their weights. Identify the type of data provided by the information in each column of the table. Okay, so first we're talking about the player. So here's the data for who the players are. It's giving me their first initial and their last name. Is this an example of numerical or non-numerical data? Well, this is non-numerical. So if it's non-numerical, then it is qualitative. And that's all I have to say about it. Notice qualitative data, that's the only way it's categorized. Quantitative data, then we would have to say whether or not it's discrete or continuous. But names, that's qualitative, we're done. Okay, the team. So again, in the second column, we see the team names listed, Detroit, Toronto, Detroit, Chicago Cubs, and then two teams. Again, this is non-numerical data, so this is qualitative. All right, next column gives their position. I think it's third base, first base, first base, left field, first base. Again, that's non-numerical data, so this is qualitative. I know there are numbers in that data, but it's not a measurement or counting an amount. And then here, there are RBI. Okay, so we have to go back to figure out exactly what RBI is and how that data is collected. And right here is the crux of the of the categorization. A batter is credited with one RBI for each run scored. So every time they score a run at one of their at-bats, they're credited with one RBI. So this statistic here, this variable is counted, right? You're counting one RBI for each run scored. So one, two, three, four. So if it's counted, obviously it's numerical data, so it's quantitative and if it's counted then it is discrete okay it was not measured it was counted and then last column here is the weight of each of the players in pounds that's clearly quantitative but weight is measured quanti Weight is measured, not counted, so that would make it continuous. Okay. Good. So you'll have to do something similar with your homework. Hopefully it's not too difficult. All right, that concludes section 2.1. Moving on to section 2.2, organizing qualitative data. So now we're just going to look at data that is non-numerical and how to organize it. Some terminology. The number of times a particular distinct value occurs is called its frequency or count. Now the relative frequency is the ratio of the frequency of a particular observation to the total number of observations. So relative frequency lets you know how often a certain characteristic is observed, a certain data value appears compared to the total number of values that were collected. A frequency distribution of qualitative data is a listing of the distinct values and their frequencies. And then a relative frequency distribution of qualitative data is a listing of the distinct values and their relative frequencies. Okay, so the only difference would be on the y-axis for a frequency distribution, you would list the frequencies. A relative frequency distribution would just list values between zero and one because you're looking at that ratio, okay? To construct a frequency distribution of qualitative data, first list the distinct values of the observations in the data set in the first column of a table. We'll work through this together. And then place a tally mark in the second column of the table in the row 
of the appropriate distinct value. And then just count up your tallies and record the totals. It's kind of common sense. You would think to do this anyways. So we're just going to move on. And then for a relative frequency distribution, you would divide each frequency by the total number of observations and list that in another column. Don't stress about writing down all these steps. We're going to work through an example and you'll get it just by looking. Um, and then other types of graphs that you can construct, which we'll do. A bar chart displays the distinct values of a qualitative data set on the horizontal axis and the relative frequencies, or you could do frequencies or percents, whatever, of those values on the vertical axis. Big thing to remember is that the bars should not touch each other. Okay, no touching. And then a pie chart, you've probably seen before plenty of times, is a disc that's divided into wedge-shaped pieces, and they're proportional to the relative frequencies of the qualitative data. And you use a pie chart when you're interested in representing the percentage breakdown of a whole with limited categories. It's not a good idea to use a pie chart when you have a bunch of different categories and so many little wedges that it doesn't really provide any useful information for your reader, okay? So use it when there's not too many different categories. All right, let's work on an example. It's not as crazy as it sounds. Here's the first one. From NCAA.com, the official website for NCAA Sports, the accompanying selection of 20 of the 26 National Collegiate Athletic Association Wrestling Championships between the years 1989 and 2014 was obtained. Use these data to construct a frequency distribution, a relative frequency distribution, a bar chart, and a pie chart. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We need a frequency distribution. We'll do that first. Relative frequency builds on that then the bar chart and the pie chart. And what we're trying to see is who are the champions across different years, okay? The frequency of each of these teams being the champions. So let's go ahead, list out on our table whoever the champions are, then I'm gonna tally that up, okay? And we're going to add to this. So right now I'm just going to have two columns and then we'll build on this. Don't fret. Okay, so what are the different champions that we see? I see Iowa, Oklahoma State, uh, Minnesota, and lastly, Penn State, right? Just four. Okay, now let's tally up how many times each of these teams was the champion. So Iowa, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yes, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yep, Oklahoma State, one, two, three, four, five, Minnesota. Uh, one, two times, and then Penn State just four times, looks like. One, two, three, four. Okay, now let's list the frequencies for each. So just total it up, see how many tallies you have. Iowa won nine times, Oklahoma five, Minnesota twice, and then Penn State four times. So bam, this is a frequency distribution. Now what we can do is also compute the relative frequency. Okay. Since they asked for that as well. So in order to do relative frequency, you first need to know what the total number of observations was. So go ahead, total up that frequency column. So we have... 9 plus 5, that's 14, plus 6, 20. We have 20 total observations. So to get the relative frequency for each of the champions, you're going to take their frequency, divide by 20. Okay, so 9 divided by 20, that's 0.45. 5 divided by 20, 
that's 0.25, 2 divided by 20, that's 0 0.10, and then lastly, 4 divided by 20 is 0 0.20. If you add up all the relative frequencies, notice 0.45 plus 0.25, that's 0.7, plus 0.1 plus 0.2 gives you 1.00. These should always add to 1, okay? 1, exactly 1 if you don't round. If you have a little bit of rounding every now and then, you might have some rounding error in your total, but all of the relative frequencies should be pretty dead on when you add them up. And then one more thing that we could easily compute since we have the relative frequencies is percent. So just multiply each of those relative frequencies by 100. So Iowa would be 45%, Oklahoma 25%, 10% for Minnesota, and then Penn State 20%. And guess what? If you add up all the percents, you should get 100. Okay? Good, so let's see, have we done everything they wanted? We got the frequency distribution relative a bar chart. Okay, so now let's make a bar chart. I'm going to list on the horizontal axis the categories, the four champions. And then we can decide for the bar chart, do we want a frequency or relative frequencies listed? Or even percents, it's really up to you. Just to spice things up, I'm gonna do the relative frequencies, okay? But they weren't specific in the direction, so do what you want. Here's relative frequency. And then down here, I'm gonna list who each of the champions are. And notice the relative frequencies go up to 0.45. So say that's 0.1, that's 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and then this is 0.4, and then these are the halves. So that's 0.45. Okay, so let's see here. Iowa is the first one with 0.45 relative frequency. So I'll draw a, a vertical bar, height 0.45. And this is for Iowa. I'll just put an I down here. And then, you know, you can shade it in or whatever. Try to make your bars all the same width, okay? So it doesn't look like one has more value or importance than the other, because it's the heights that's telling us what's important. So that's Iowa. Um, Oklahoma, 0.25 relative frequency. So that looks like it's right here. O for Oklahoma. I start always hearing that song from the musical. I'm not going to sing for you guys. Don't worry. I'll spare you that. Um, who is next? Minnesota. Minnesota, oh, with only 0.1. They're not champions too often. Poor things. Okay, notice the bars are not touching. They're pretty evenly spaced. And then lastly is Penn State, 0.2 right here. Okay, P for Penn State. Let's do yellow. Now, whether I labeled the y-axis relative frequency or just frequency or just percent, the bar heights should still all be in the same proportion to one another. It's just that you're scaling these values differently, okay? But the graph should all pretty much look exactly the same. You'll just have different numbers here if you do frequency or percent instead, okay? Now, what about if you wanna make a pie chart? In this class, you will not have to make a pie chart by hand. It's really tedious because you would need to get out your compass, protractor, or whatever, and measure the angles <laughs> because the idea is you're going to take a circle and divide it into wedges that are proportional to the relative frequencies or the percents for each category, okay? So what that would require is, say, for example, Iowa is 0.45 or 45% of the circle. Well, we know a circle has 360 degrees. That's one complete revolution. 
So you need to measure off a wedge that's 162 degrees for Iowa. That's not gonna be easy to do. And then similarly, Oklahoma is 25%, 25% of 360 is 90 degrees. So I mean, that one maybe you could do, not so bad. This would be the wedge for Oklahoma. If we pretend this is 90 degrees, I just eyeballed it right now. Minnesota would be 0 0.10% 10 of 360, so 36 degrees. And then Penn State would be 0 0.20 of 360, so 72 degrees. So you could see the wedges would be kind of difficult. 162, I don't know, something like this something like this but for our for our class you're not going to be doing these by hand there's plenty of you know tools that are available to us that are really useful you can even make a great pie chart in microsoft excel so go ahead give it a try this is i made this in excel so i just put in the names of the champions into the cells in one column and then next to it i put their percents instead of relative frequency and yeah, you just go to Chart Wizard and it comes out pretty, pretty beautiful, right? So don't worry, we won't be doing these by hand in this class, but just be able to identify what a pie chart should look like for certain data. Make sure that the wedges are proportional to the relative frequencies. And it wouldn't be useful, you know, if you had a pie chart with like a ton of categories, that would not be the best graph to choose. So later on, you know, when you're collecting data and you're working in research or you're putting a study together, you want to publish something, you want to pick a graph that's going to help your reader, help your audience interpret and understand the data. So you have to choose carefully between your options. Is a bar chart better? Is a pie chart better? Is just a frequency table better? Etc. Okay? Different circumstances require different representations. You need to know them all. So that concludes the lesson. Give the video a thumbs up if you found it helpful. And coming up, we're going to look at how to organize quantitative data, distribution shapes, and misleading graphs.